Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to another Red Pill Religion podcast, Red Pill Religion, where we say there are two kinds of people, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. All, all in hell, choose it. So if you like the kind of content we have here on Red Pill Religion, please support our, red, our work on redpillreligion.com. Please remember in these days of heavy social media uh, madness, we could disappear off of here anytime. Uh, just be aware we have moved. We, 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 we do have a BitChute channel. Please find us on BitChute. We actually have two BitChute channels. Uh, we are also opening up on WeGather. If you go to WeGather app, not WeGather.com, but WeGatherApp.com, you'll find that we have opened up a discussion community on there where we also have fundraising options. We are, we are, we are not going to be on uh, um, um, Patreon forever. We are definitely going to be leaving Patreon. Um, you know, sayonara and thanks for all the cash, but we've, we've had enough and we're leaving. You'll find us on We Gather app and subscribe star by the end of this month. So uh, in any case, we are still running a fundraiser in joint with the Freedom from Atheism Foundation. So if you could hit that PayPal tip jar, we're at 120 bucks. Oh, we're going to keep going until we reach a thousand, no matter how long it takes. We know times are tough and everybody's holding out for cash. But if you have a, a, the ability to hit the tip jar, I would appreciate it. And so in other, uh, moving on to other things, joining us as usual on Wednesday nights is raconteur, uh, retired lawyer, writer, and general all nerdy good guy. Say hi, John. See you, right? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody, please be sure to visit scifiright.com where you will find, first off, you'll find some free fiction, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But if you, uh, you can also, if you click on the works button at the top, you can go to buy his professionally published uh, uh, work, uh, award nominated, award winning, and generally well reviewed and respected science fiction and fantasy, which you can buy on Amazon and other booksellers. Although I'm starting to think that Amazon is slumming, John. Good God, it's getting out bad out there. Anyway, the 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 for a sample of John's fiction, see at the very top of the page today, Lost on the Last Continent, episode 88, Ravage of the Red Tower. What's going on on that story, sir? Has the hero died yet? As you can read, it says that in this exciting episode, the Corsairs, led by Colonel Lost, are uh, once more turned to the attack and discover that the Eighth Men have another reason to launch an assault against the city of swift death than what seems. So, the worst comes to the worst. The uh, Everything is, is uh, it just turns out horrible for my hero. And as you can see, I've written here, my trembling pen wilts above the tear-stained manuscript. What author can continue a tale of such hopeless grief? How terrible! There's no way for Colonel Lost to recover. What a horrible turn of events. Begin the lamentations. Let the virgin's wail burn the Viking ships. So, that what's happened in this episode is so bad and so <laughs> horrific that I'm not even sure that anyone should read it. It's just too, it's just too sad. I, I see. So you're saying by the end of it, these people are putting pineapple on pizza. No, sorry. Uh, not that bad. Let's. I mean, let's keep a tinge of reason here in our uh, in our uh, discourses. I pineapple. I actually like pineapple pizza. Don't tell anybody. I'm a heretic. I know. It's too late to, too late to say that. Yeah. Um, so uh, Vox Day will be mad. Well, I'll be Vox Day can be mad at me because I called myself one. Anyway, um, the the the. Uh, Please note, by the way, that I forgot to mention this in the intro, but we are actually turning off commenting on YouTube as another protective measure. Plus, we're finding it's just a time sink. We are going to move discussions to the Red Pill Religion blog or to Mr. Wright's blog on the right on the nights when we have him here. So I will be I have not watched the comments on his blog for like two years. I've been derelict in doing that. And I want to start watching them and responding to people there. But you'll also find us on We Gather app for more intensive discussions. So, okay. So anyway, go check out that blog. Go hit his tip jar, or just go buy some of his books. If you buy at least twenty of them at once, uh, um, he'll give you a free kitten. No, I'm just kidding. But please support his work. Support this this author's work. Also visit ljajilamplighter.com. So okay, John. I, I got the idea that we're going to talk about hell tonight because I saw that on one of your previous comment threads on your sci-fi 
Right.com. You had an extended argument with, I believe it was a gentleman we had on here to argue scripture before. I think he was, you were arguing with him again. Was his name Justin, I think, or yeah. am I mistaken? Yeah. He, uh, he's converted. Has he really? Uh, yes. Well, he wrote me and said he did. He said he, he, uh, he said that his argument with me was not, was not, he apologized and said it wasn't quite sincere because he had been suffering from severe doubts about his atheism for a long time. And that uh, that he was kind of uh, play acting some of his objections to me, and uh, that he was going to uh, enter the uh, enter the church. That is so awesome, Justin. I hope you'll come on sometime and talk to us. Uh, it brought tears to my eyes. I, I hope I'm not confusing him with some of the guy with a similar name because that would be horrible if I were. Oh, I know but, he could be out there right now screaming and cursing your name. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I, I, I think it was him. I think it was he. I'm pretty sure it was him, yeah. So in any case, the... Uh, the main objection as an atheist to believing in God was believing in hellfire. He thought that it was so outrageous and so unfair that God, for no reason, you know, for no no rational reason, would simply condemn some, you know, innocent people to uh, an, eternal, an eternity of excruciating, uh, painful burning uh, forever with no possibility of parole. Uh, merely for not being born, you know, uh, within the uh, within a spot on Earth where you could hear about the Christ, uh, or you were too young to understand it, or you uh, uh, you died before being baptized on your way to the uh, on your way to the church in the first week of life, you know. So, so to him, that was a he he brought that topic up uh, uh, over and over again uh, a lot. It was it was his main. It was his main worry, and I certainly have some sympathy with him because I had I felt very similarly back when I was an atheist. I thought the idea of hell was absolutely outrageous and absolutely atrocious, and and couldn't fathom how, why anyone. I mean, I can understand someone believing in some horrible Aztec deity, Tezcatlipoca, or a left-handed hummingbird or something, who uh, condemned people to eternities of eternities of fire and pain. Uh, but I couldn't imagine as as a god regarded as good, just, or benevolent, you know, especially for something so arbitrary as not believing in Christ. I mean, how does that how does that work? I'm I'm born in uh, I'm born in the Himalayan mountains or in uh, in, uh, in north of uh, north of Alaska somewhere, and I don't get to hear about Christ during my lifetime, and and suddenly I'm you know burning forever. It just seems ridiculous. Yeah, and 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 it does become hard because I, I had I had a similar objection. Um, and eventually I came to peace with it, realizing, A, it's ultimately not up to me, right? Reality is what it is. Um, and B, uh, I, it, you'll get your hardcore, old school, rock rib Thomist Catholics of the, like, Council of Trent guys, especially your guys who are set of vacantist or just kind of one step away from being set as, will really usually be down hardcore on this, um, uh, Yes, you will be going and spending an attorney and in literal hellfire um, if you are not if you do not die die within the sacraments of the Catholic Church, uh, unless you're martyred or something. Um, and you know that's very much like the let's say your fire and brimstone Southern Baptists who will tell you know if you fail to believe the correct formulation about Jesus Christ, the same awaits you. Be careful um, though, because the Church does not teach that the visible, literal boundaries of the sacraments of the Catholic Church are where the where the boundary line is. They say it's the church, but they yeah. mean the church in heaven and the church in purgatory. They, they say it's the eternal church. And some people fall within the boundary that you might not think. Right, and there's ample evidence for that in the scriptures. That's why some of the set of vacantists and some of the most rock-ribbed old-school Catholics, it's like, Dude, you need to, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong and they're going to insist that I'm going against church teaching. But no, it's always been more complicated than that. No, there was a there was a bishop whose name I forget who preached just the, within this century that no one outside the visible boundaries of the Catholic Church could be saved. And the church condemned him as a heretic. So that he was outside the visible boundaries of the church. So he would better hope he was wrong on that point. Yeah. <laughs> In reality, here's how I read it, and I haven't been struck down as, I mean, it's funny, 
I came up this way in 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 Protestant circles because I grew up a sola scriptura funda, you know, kind of fun, more or less sort of fundamentalist, sort of mainline Protestant, sort of fundamentalist. Um, and people would argue scripture all the time, and they would argue what heaven and hell were really like all the time, and who was saved and who wasn't. In fact, it seems to me that in evangelical circles, like one of the favorite uh, debates that never ends is like. Once saved, always saved. Uh, how does uh, justification work exactly? And they will go at it with each other for hours. Um, to be honest, I took what, what I took away from that is the same thing I've noticed within the Catholic Church, and in fact, all the branches of Orthodoxy that I have found. None of the, all of them basically admit when you really push us, we don't actually know. We don't really know who's saved or not. We don't, and it would be heresy to say that you knew anybody was. I disagree. There's one person we know for sure was saved. Well, uh, okay. Well, like. The thief on the cross. Christ himself turned to the guy and said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Oh, right. And guess what? No sacrament, no baptism, no Eucharist, no confession, no, no nothing. Correct. Now, um, the church. Uh, if you're if you're willing to, if you're a Catholic, you can say the saints are saved. The reason why we know we're saved is because people have seen them in visions and they've uh, carried prayers to, to the altar of God and they've uh, granted miracles and so on and so forth. If they're participating in the good work of God, they're they're, they're for God. They're part of God. So. Yeah, it gets tricky. You know, do they have to know the literal name of Jesus literally? Do they have to have the right belief about Jesus literally? Do they have to have the exact sacraments in the exact correct order in, in the right sequence in order to, you know? Well, here's what we do know. We know that Christ says anyone who goes to God goes through him. Right. Okay. We don't know. And in the, in the parable of the goats and the uh, sheep, he doesn't say to the goats and the sheep, here's a quiz on the filioque controversy. Does this Holy Ghost proceed from the Father and the Son together or only from the Father alone? Anyone who gets the answer wrong goes to hell. That is not what happens in that, in that parable. What happens in the parable is he says, did you feed me? Did you, did you uh, clothe me when I was naked? Did you give me a cup of water when I was thirsty? Did you come visit me in prison when I was, when I was in prison? And the sheep and the goats all go, well, we didn't see you, Lord. What, what are you talking about? Who are you talking about? And he says, as you have done to Lisa Bond, so you've done to me. Okay. So the standard of what, what you need to do to get into heaven is pretty clear. You have to uh, approach Christ. He's got to let you in. You know? Now, we were also given certain, we, we Christians were also given certain instructions to how to get in. Baptism, sacraments, love God. Nothing can pluck him, nothing is going to pluck you out of the hand of, of, of Christ, what the, who, who the Lord has put in his hand. Now, uh, as for once saved, always saved, I will point out that I'm pretty sure Jesus didn't make it. I don't know for sure, though. Yeah, I get, yeah. And he was, a, he was an archbishop. I mean, he was he was an apostle. Okay. He was, he was very high in the hierarchy of the Catholic Church at the time, consisted of 12 guys. Yeah. Yeah. And, and his ultimate sin, by the way, wasn't, uh, was not uh, that he betrayed Christ. People miss yeah. that one. Literally, literally, Judas could have run up to Jesus and said, I'm so sorry, and hit his knees, and it would have been good. But he didn't do that, did he? Peter did it. Peter did. Later. Yeah. Peter said, yeah. I love you, Christ. You know I love you. No, what he did is he gave up. He gave up in despair. And yep. he didn't get it. He, Jesus wouldn't do what he wanted, because he wanted him to be a military hero. He was too angry at him, too. You know? Um, yeah. Pride, arrogance, fear. Um, that's what did it. And yeah, technically, we don't know for sure anyone's in hell. It's true. The place could be empty. We don't know. But we also know that Christ says, many are called and few are chosen. The way, to, the path to destruction is wide. And then the straight and narrow is straight and narrow. I, I, I came so that I might save some. That's, that's where we heard the straight and narrow from. Yeah. yeah. That I might save some. Woof. Hard right. work. Now, because this just came up this week, let me read. I was so delighted. There was a, a group of uh, my heroes, the uh, the Knights of Malta. I, the reason they're my heroes is because I have a, in one of my science fiction books, I have the Knights Hospitaliar as a, 
uh, super kick-ass uh, uh, space warriors who are fighting on behalf of the uh, of the sacerdotal, you know, ecumenical Catholic Church of the far future. Uh, and so I'm delighted whenever they show up again because they're still a knightly order and they're still a sovereign knightly order. They they haven't controlled Malta ever since Napoleon's day and age. Anyway, the the uh, not the provost. What's his name? The uh, uh, the cardinal Leo Burke, patron of the uh, sovereign military order of Malta, together with the uh, cardinal uh, uh, Pajetas, uh, s- several archbishops have put together a document called uh, Declaration of the Truths Relating to the Common Areas of the Church in Our Time. And the reason why they felt the need to, uh, and all it is is a, is, a, is a list reciting what the Catholics believe and what we've always believed. And the only reason why they're putting it out is because some of the pastors of the church, some of the shepherds, have not been clear in putting out the message as to what we actually believe and what we actually don't believe. And I'll tell you what, the truth of the matter is, I mean, you get, a, especially guys who are hooked in hard on the Council of Trent, you know, they say this council is infallible and laid down some pretty heavy uh, language that, you know, other councils haven't used. And, you know, a lot of the fight with the Eastern Church, with what we now call the Eastern Orthodox, actually did come over arguments over soter- uh, what we call soteriology, what a heaven and hell and all that look like. Mm-hmm. And, and it was mostly, you know, like, for example, the Romans, you know, the church in the West always, you know, usually leaned heavily on the idea that hell includes corporeal fire. And the Easterners have always been resistant to that one. Um, it's, it's still kind of a standing disagreement, except that it is no longer considered a church, church dividing issue. Um, and there are, you know, Eastern Catholics believe some of the ways that the Eastern Orthodox do and some of the other Orthodox do, who are not in full communion but partial, which means even as Catholics, we're, we're willing to consider it. One of the most fascinating things about the Eastern idea of, of the fires of hell, which just rings so true to me, I think it can't, almost can't not be this way. The, the, literally, the fires of hell, or they don't use the word purgatory, but whatever, um, uh, are in fact literally the love of the Holy Spirit, which they are perceiving as fire because they hate it. I've heard a similar thing. I've heard a similar poetic image uh, spoken of by uh, uh, Dorothy Sayers, who says that the fire of love that comes from God to the blessed seems like light, to those in purgatory seems like a cleansing flame, and to those in hell seems like an all-consuming hellfire. And it's the same light. Yeah. Now, the reason why that is such an adroit um, uh, metaphor is I think there's a certain logic involved. The reason why I believe in hell is not because I want to believe it. If there's any doctrine of the, of the Christian church that I could change, if I was given a vote, that would be the first one to go. Oh, and yeah. I think it is so painful and so horrible. But I think it underestimates what an immense, unearthly gift God gave us by making us in his image. And by in his image, I don't mean upright bipeds. God is a spirit. He doesn't have any physical characteristics. He, I... he, gave, us, he gave us free will. He gave us the creative power that he has, the ability to decide things, yes or no. We're not just machines. We're not just material. Material things pass away. Spiritual things never pass away. Right. So far, are you with me so far? Yeah. Now, in, in, uh, the reason why I mentioned this uh, this uh, do- declaration of truths by that was put out by uh, some church, some uh, archbishops and uh, and the knights of uh, the knights of Malta, is paragraph eight says hell exists, and those who are condemned to hell for any unrepented mortal sin are eternally punished there by divine justice. Not only fallen angels but also human souls are damned eternally, and they re- reference. Uh, Matthew 25, and they reference uh, right. Thessalonians uh, uh, first, uh, second Peter. Uh, let me Eternally comment on that. Beings. Eternally damned human beings will not be annihilated since their souls are immortal according to the infallible teachings of the church. See the Fifth Lateran Council, such an eight. Okay, so that's the church teaching. Now, you can say the church is wrong, or should be wrong if you like, but that's what they teach. The, the most hardcore paranoid uh, uh, way that you'll hear Catholics preaching it is like literally, 
you commit one mortal sin and then you die and you didn't get to confession, you're 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 done. But that's that's a little more paranoia making. I mean, it could be that way, but um, we don't believe a genuinely faithful person doesn't get a chance. You know, they just by accident. They died five minutes after they masturbated to some porn or something. Boom. Um, quite the opposite. The the Catechism of the Catholic Church makes it quite clear that it has to be a long series of unrepentant uh, sins that that have driven the will to a point where uh, he no longer seeks redemption. He no longer has the capacity for for joy. No longer has the ability to to seek out God's love. That's right, and it's uh, a very dire circumstance. I don't think I don't think human beings. Here's the problem. We're talking about eternity. Time right. Here, it's not like time here. It's hard for us to imagine. If any human king acted this way, burned people for not believing in him, it would be outrageous. But, but God is both a person and a divine uh, eternal principle on which all reality is based. It's like we're arguing about if the law of non-contradiction. Hello, are you still there? Yeah. Okay, I'm getting a weird feedback. If the law of non-contradiction came alive, or justice herself was a person, and it, if you reject, uh, and God is love. So logically, there's only two possibilities. Excuse me, belay that. There's three possibilities. There's an intermediate state where the decision has not been made yet. The jury is still out. Okay? That's what we call life and, if you like, purgatory, if you believe in purgatory, and I do. If... Uh, uh, if there's reincarnation, like the Buddhists preach, and not uh, resurrection, like the Christians preach, then the intermediate state goes on forever with no end. It's an endless wheel of, of suffering, and there's no way off. Uh, the, the Buddha does promise uh, self-annihilation. It does promise that you can achieve a nirvana, achieve a state of, of philosophical uh, uh, peace. Right. Despite the, so, but if you don't believe in reincarnation, and, and I'm a Christian, so I don't, then... What are the other two options? How do you... Okay. God is love. Is love voluntary or involuntary? Right. It's voluntary. It's got to be voluntary. If you don't return it, what happens to it? Right. It goes away. Right. So by definition, by definition, can't be anything other than reciprocal and voluntary. Love rewards love. And if it's voluntary, then there's those who can refuse it. Yeah. By refusing it, they're excluded from love. Now, we're talking about God, so we're talking about eternal love. Infinite right. bliss. We're not talking about a static state of a person being a vegetable or something, like on some crappy science fiction right. show. All that is good and all that is true. You've chosen to reject. All that is true. Now, in life on Earth, sometimes the good and the true are disconnected from each other. So we see some good in some places and other goods in other places, and some things that seem good at first but are not and certain addictive behaviors or certain addictive drugs. Some women who look like they're going to be the Mrs. Right for you, but they're actually a you know a terrible uh, uh, vampiress, or a, a guy who looks like he's Mr. Perfect and he just turns out to be a you know a sinner like everyone else. There are disappointments in life. The good is sometimes hard to, to detect after death. That's not going to be the case. God is the source of all good. He's the thing that makes good good. He's the thing that makes good goodness. Yeah. So if you, if you if you if you uh, as an atheist I accepted reason but I rejected God. As a Christian I see reason as coming from God. God yeah. is the word for the logos. So yeah. so all the ambiguities that plague us in life are going to be abolished. You're going to have to either accept the package deal of everything good or since you have free will reject the package deal of everything good. Here's and what does that mean? That means you don't have infinite love well i don't care what else you do have i don't care how nice it is in hell i mean hell could just i, I myself believe in you know it's flame but let's just say it was a uh a, a pleasant uh, uh house in the suburb if you're deprived from the infinite love of christ for eternity the, the the ratio between that and infinite love is not a ratio it's it's the same ratio as between one and zero it's like trying to divide by zero there's no way to comprehend how bad that is in comparison 
And let me let me make a point that I think gets missed too lost. And, and this this I think really becomes I I literally do blame Calvinism. It blows it blows me a red pill religion away because we could talk to people of all sorts of religions, but it's, we can almost never get along with a Calvinist and sola fideists because they've got the idea of salvation tied up in whether or not you believed the right intellectual formula. I literally had a Calvinist, uh, RCA for short, literally tell me, because I, I, I said I give, you get saved by, by, by believing, right? You, by, because by belief they mean have, have accepted the intellectual proposition. Jesus Christ is Lord. I said, okay, what do I have to believe about Jesus? And he said, well, you have to believe it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm like, okay, so if I don't believe the right formulation of the Trinity, I go to hell. This is madness. Okay, this is a mad way of looking at what God meant by Jesus meant by believe in me. It's a lot deeper than that, including the fact that believing in him means following his laws and doing what he says and what he warns you about and taking seriously what he says to do or not do. Um, and, and, and beyond that, people, Calvinists, maybe they see this, maybe they don't. I used to wonder why would anybody choose hell? But I've met enough people at this point in my life. There obviously are people who want to go to hell. I've met them. I I just listened to an argument given by a woman. I don't know her, but I heard her argument where she claims that it's okay to abort a child in the womb on the grounds that the child is taking nutrients from the mother. Therefore, the mother is like someone who's doing the work of a gest of a gestation machine. Right, unpaid labor. Yeah, unpaid unpaid labor, and therefore, in order to uh, uh, expel the trespasser and the parasitical organism, uh, lethal violence is therefore justified. And I thought to myself, if this woman had a choice between family, motherhood, a mother's love for her baby, and I, and, and other, I'm a male, so my the forms of love known to me. I think are slightly weak <laughs> compared to a mother's love for her own baby. No, they're not. I really do. Okay. Uh, uh, at least in my case, I won't speak for other men. Uh, for her to exclude herself from that, and at the same time, to exclude herself from all human justice, because innocence and guilt no longer concern her, to exclude her from all uh, legality, all reason, because this argument was so unreasonable, you couldn't reason from her. She's, she, she's in one argument. She got rid of truth. She got rid of beauty. She got rid of virtue. Okay, those are those are the those are fairly big things to get rid of in your life. And considering another human being completely disposable so coldly, it's like, well, why does anybody want to consider you in any other way either? Yeah. yeah. Why would God treat you any different? Toss you away? Why not? You correct. Know? Correct. So, to me, that looked like someone who wanted to be in hell. They. They. They crave misery. They crave oppression because being a victim makes them feel important. And that, because the, the other option is being humble and accepting the love of God. So, and to a proud person, that is unacceptable. They're going to have to give up their self-esteem in order to achieve infinite bliss and endless love. Horrible. <laughs> Death first. I'm and convinced. I didn't used to think this. I thought that a person... Would, would guard his own self-interest, and at least that his own self desire for self-preservation, if nothing else, would would uh, urge him. And that whole that whole idea of justification, I, I don't even want to go into what Protestants, because they get into these horrible arguments that just make me want to scream over justification is by blah blah. I, I don't even want to go there. Ultimately, if you're if you if you're going if you're approaching the God thinking you're justified in everything you did because you have, you know, and not really penitent, that's where you're in the biggest trouble, frankly. And this also brings, by the way, I want to transition us a little to, the, but, but to a tough subject that is interesting, I think, which is the subject of purgatory. Before we transition, I'd like to make a comment about the, about what you said about the, uh, the Calvinists first. Sure. With deep apologies to my Calvinist brethren and also to any Mohammedans who may be listening, uh, I've studied heresies more than most Catholics have. I've, I've read up on it and I've looked into it. I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I'm saying it's like a hobby of mine. Heresies fascinate me. And all the old heresies, all, all the new heresies are just old heresies come again. That's one reason why I'm not a Protestant. I couldn't bring myself to become a Protestant because it's the same old stuff just dressed up in another in another garb. 
the insistence on a specific verbal formula as the key to salvation is something we find in uh, many schools of Mohammedan thought. Sure. And the idea that the book is sacred is also Mohammedan. And Muhammad was around in the well, not sacred, time. but is like it was is the is the word. Yes, they, they will they will frequently yeah. treat the Bible as if it is the word spoken of in scriptures, like it itself is the logos somehow. They're getting yeah. the con they're getting the concepts messed up. That's why that's why it's so important. You can use the same words and have different meanings and come to a completely different conclusion, but right. But I'm saying that that is they also have no priesthood, both the Protestants and the Muslims. Right. They, have a, they have a much simpler, easier to understand uh, uh, idea of soteriology and of uh, the afterlife and so on and so forth. They simplified things. Now, I'm not saying this necessarily makes one, one or the other wrong, but I'm saying it is interesting to note that the certain patterns of when people break away from the Catholic Church, they always tend to do certain things over and over again. And to be, to be quite frank, it becomes less, the, the her heretical ideas become less enticing, less uh, interesting to me because I've seen them before so many times. Catholic and not a, not a, not a Protestant. Yeah, this is and exactly I, why. And, and I don't feel that way about the Eastern Orthodox because they're not, they're, they're, they're in a schism with us. We broke apart based on a, based on who was in charge argument. Not, um, I mean, there's some, don't get me wrong, there's some filioque stuff and, you know, one or two things, and a difference of emphasis, but it's not, it's not. Well, it's what I would say the there, I'm, having had a number of Eastern Orthodox friends, some very strongly feel Rome is so badly in error that, that unity is impossible on any number of issues. And then there's a number of other Eastern Orthodox who are like, guys, come on. <laughs> we, you know, Rome needs to change some things, but we're not perfect. And well, whatever. I, I, without getting into all that, and it, you get... I'm even more uh, fascinated by the Assyrian and the, uh, you know, the Antiochian Orthodox and the Alexandrians. But the, what's interesting about all these ancient branches of Christianity is they will frequently fight like cats and dogs over very similar concepts. For example, I'll just flick, one of the things that got me into what I consider authentic first century Bible Christianity, a.k.a. Uh, was Christian Orthodoxy generally, and this thing called the Orthodox Wiki was very, very helpful. It's, it's, it has a small Catholic uh, presence, but it's mostly run by Eastern Orthodox, but with heavy uh, participation by Assyrian and Antioch, uh, you know, the Antiochans and the Alexandrians, the pre-Chalcedonians. So it, it winds up being a very impressive pan-Orthodox effort. And the, and, and, and the article on purgatory is particularly interesting because nobody but Rome accepts the term purgatory. So everybody's annoyed with Rome for having made up a word, which, you know, to Orthodox thinking is like, you're, you're innovating when you're making up new words. And I, I can appreciate that, episode, that attitude anyway. Um, but what they all have is various ideas on, the, on purgatory anyway. They all do. The, the way the, 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 those who follow the Sea of Peter have purgatory, um, and we use the actual word, is that it's a real specific, and I think you can knock Thomas Aquinas for this, almost mechanistic, like, you know, you do this sacrament gets you this effect for this amount, and this sacramental will get you this amount of points in purgatory, and others um, object to that specific model, um, but they all, it turns out, agree. There is a state between heaven and hell, and they all agree that you will, unless you manage to attain a certain, basically to attain sainthood by the time you die, that you manage to purge yourself of all your sins and, and pay all your debts before you died. If you manage that, you're going to go straight to heaven. But if not, you're going to be doing some more work in the afterlife. Uh, uh, a lot of Eastern Orthodox have a, like if you look on the, on, on and, and by the way, when I say Eastern Orthodox, there will be Catholic, Eastern Catholics who, who, who express the same views. So these theories aren't heretical. They're within the boundaries of the Catholic Church. Eastern Catholics of various sorts entertain these ideas. Um, the Eastern Orthodox, looking on this, for example, they tend to believe that um, there is a waiting period. It's not purgatory fire, but you're still going to be working off the effects of whatever sins that you were still holding on to when you die. 
And there's even a model within the Orthodox of something called the toll roads. And the toll roads sound remarkably like both Dante's Inferno and uh, Purgatory, only tougher. Because in the toll roads, this is ancient. This goes back in the Eastern churches, especially really ancient. That basically there'll be, I believe it's seven toll roads that you're going to have uh, have to get past. And uh, uh, funny because that's the number of cornices on Mount Purgatory in Dante's in Dante's poem. Yeah, and 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 basically at each toll you will be assessed. Basically, you'll be assessed a toll uh, of various sorts for various sorts of sin. And whatever merits you have earned in life uh, will be used to pay the toll. So you get to advance all the way up to the ch top um, that way. Only if you run out of merits before you're done, boom, straight to hell for you, buddy. Now, most Eastern Orthodox don't believe that model is literal. Um, uh, but a few will staunchly hold on that it is exactly literal. Uh, the the take-home message I have from that is, is that in reality, when you're talking about soteriology, uh, the salvation, outside of your basic Bible Christians, the vast majority of all Christians, including intelligent Protestants, believe there is something like purgatory. And I, for one, would like to think that m anybody who really dies thinking, I'm sorry, I want to know the truth, you know, I want to follow the truth, I want to follow the light, I'm sorry for anything I've done. I, I, I really think there's real hope for anybody who dies that way, but they will be in purgatory and will be hanging out there for a real long while. Um, well, the, um, the medieval Christians, and I include myself as one of those, believe we believe in what's called the harrowing of hell. We think that when Christ went down into hell during the three days when he was dead, he picked up all of the Jewish patriarchs and Adam and Eve and everyone else who, who God wanted to save. Now, since there's no time in eternity, you know, and since God saves who he will, <laughs> uh, if you're in hell, if you find yourself in hell, try praying to Christ, and maybe you'll be saved, because maybe, maybe that's just purgatory, and it's not hell after all, because you don't know. So, uh, I think of it as, a, as, as the kind of thing where, the reason why I, I say maybe there's literal fire, but maybe not, because I think it's actually it's something actually worse down there, the fire of knowing you had the opportunity to return the love of your infinitely benevolent father, the source of all good, of all justice, of all beauty, of all virtue, and you turned your back on it, and you get to look at the face of the devil, a guy who was even smarter and more beautiful and higher in the ranking of the universe than you are, because he's an angel and you're a, you're a muggle, okay? And he lost it too, and you can see it in his eyes. The idea of the miserific vision, the vision of misery that's going to be in, in hell, that's going to be in your soul, because, I, I, let me emphasize this, we here on earth, we get to ignore things in our minds. We get to forget things. We get to put things away from ourselves. I have no belief that in eternity we're going to be able to hide behind excuses anymore. When the light comes on, in the dark, it's hard to see. It's hard to make out the shapes in the gloom. When the lights come on, you're going to see where everyone's standing and every smallest thing is going to be revealed. All your sins are going to leap out of the shadow behind you and, and testify against you in a court of law. Everyone's going to know everything you've done. See? And uh, compared to the loss of turning your back on love itself, of giving up love, life, hope, uh, beauty, virtue, goodness, forever, uh, I'm sorry, the, the burning pain w w w would be a welcome distraction, it seems to me. To, uh, so, like I say, I, I think there's physical flame there, but I don't think that's the worst of the, of the torment to know. Are you still there? I don't hear you. Hello? I am sorry, I had a technical glitch there. Uh, thanks, I was trying to say something, but I'm back. Yeah, I think, and, and I think there's a point that, that, that can't be stressed enough here. Uh, I, I've literally seen it in people. See, you get this idea of once saved, always saved. But what if the person genuinely hates God and wants to go to hell? Because I have, I've I literally met people who I really believe feel that way. And by the way, I do believe there are people 
You can call me crazy. I know this happens. People literally do sign so, sign contracts with the devil. Now you can decide that they're they're fake and the devil's not honoring them. I'm not inclined to think necessarily that that's so, but people do do this, and they know what's what's coming and they don't care. Um, as a lawyer, I can tell you those contracts are not enforceable at law. So if you because they're against the public interest, so if you go to Christ and say. Please rip up that contract for me, sir. Oh yeah, he'll, he'll pay off your debt that you owe the devil, and he'll he'll stay, stand in your place. Jesus literally uh, will. Yeah, but, yeah, but but go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. So Jesus literally will do that. We anybody who signed a contract like that, and by the way, I'm pretty sure a few professional atheists who listen to this show have literally done that. I, I have insider information. Uh, literally, whoever told you you can't get out of that lie will get you out of any such contract you signed with anybody. Okay, and anybody out there who says I'm kooky, well, listen, we get around, we hear from people. There are people signing those contracts who think they're binding. Nope, Jesus will take care of that right, right, right away for you if that's what you really want. The thing is, is that it's pretty clear to me some really don't want it. I really do think salvation can be tossed away. When, when asked if hell is empty, I think there it can't be, because I've just, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. But it can't be empty because it's pretty clear people. There's people who hate hell and hate themselves, and even find the thought of eternal hellfire uh, exquisite somehow. I can, I can say that I would like it to be empty if it was up to me, because God is love. He's infinite love. He has all time to keep trying again. Eventually, he'll wear down the resistance of the sinner and and welcome into paradise. That that seems reasonable to me if someone wants to believe that. But a that's not what the church teaches. And B, it underestimates the gift of free will. Yeah. God gave us a horrifyingly powerful gift, the ability to decide our own eternal fate, which is not given unto any other creature. Well, angels, excuse me, angels can decide to damn themselves, and a third of them did. Right. It's not given to the animals to decide their fate. Their fate depends on us. Yeah. Uh, so if we use that authority that divine god-given authority as little gods ourselves to damn ourselves then god is going to say thy will be done you're a little version of me i'm going to respect you even even though you've you've you know used all your powers for your own self-destruction uh-huh and as yeah. horrible as that sounds i can't logically see any other way it could be not a free will. Literally, yeah, literally. I mean, to use the the overstretched metaphor. So, okay, you know what? Instead of using Hitler, I'll use Stalin. Same thing. I mean, he died peacefully in his bed um, after just some of the most horrific mass murder bloodshed in history. And by the way, I happen to know, just before he died, he signed an order that would have caused the execution of pretty much every Jew in Russia. Um, would have all been sent to the gulags, and his superiors more or less decided they would wait to see <laughs> the, uh, that they have, didn't have any superiors on earth. Just, just his. I, I meant no, no, I meant not his superiors, his lackeys, many. lackeys, his under his immediate lackeys. underlings. Yeah, um, his uh, uh, literally said, "We're going to wait to see if he wakes up and still means it," and he died instead. Don't tell me that guy like. I don't. I think he knew, wanted to go to hell and was just fine with it. I'll say two things about it. One, Stalin did a lot worse than Hitler, and I don't know why we don't use him as the example for. Uh, I got my ideas, but yeah. History. Two, I, I believe the legend or the rumor that says Mussolini, when he was being hauled up by the neck to die, called out for salvation, and he's probably in heaven, and, and God bless him if he is. Most likely, yeah. There's a great one on census fidelium, which I don't have it, but it's one of my favorite Catholic YouTube channels. And there's the story there. I can't remember the name of this German uh, uh, evil Nazi bastard. Not, I mean, one of the really evil ones who had killed a whole lot of people. Yeah. And they could, and and he decided, and he had been a terror to this entire area, and everybody hated him. And he decided at the last minute to call on a priest, and only one priest would go. A lot of them simply refused. They were that horrified by the guy, which is wrong on the priest's part, but yeah, gives you a sign that really this guy, yeah. one guy went, and 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 that guy confessed, and and you know what? He's going to have a lot. Of, I'm sure he's still in purgatory, <laughs> and I'm sure it's not great. Here's the sad thing about that. Our atheist friends are scandalized and shocked that God would be so nice to such a bad person. 
But our atheist friends don't seem to realize what real sin consists of and, and, and what its effects are. Every bad thing that guy did will be will be gone and forgotten in 500 years or 1,000. Yeah. They probably will not be remembered 10,000 years from now. But if you hate your brother, even if you never say a word to him, never stab him in the back, never do anything to let him know you hate him, that's in your soul, buddy. That's going to be forever. That's going to be for eternity. You, you, you atheists think you know what life consists of, but you have everything upside down and backwards. The hatred in the, in the heart uh, is, is, according to Christ, is just as bad as the hatred of a, of a communist toward the Jew. So, uh, yeah. It causes mass murder. The mass murdered people, they're no longer on earth, but they're not dead. They, they can't be dead. Spirits can't die. And the fact is, is that whether you endorse the explicit doctrine of the purgatory or one of the many other doctrines similar to it found within Christian teaching going back thousands of years, the truth is that 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 guy who did all those horrible things, hey, he's going to pay for it before he gets to heaven. It's not going to be easy. And second, um, we haven't touched on this, but within almost all Catholic teaching going back forever, there are actually different levels of heaven. And, and all that stuff about storing up riches in heaven and, and, and all that sort of thing. I mean, everybody's going to be perfectly happy in heaven, but some are going to have a much more abundant. I mean, it, we're going to have more or less in heaven. We will. It's, there's still going to be a hierarchy. All the vessels, all the glasses will be full, but some are brandy snifters and some are little sippy cups and some are thimbles. May, may you be a brandy snifter. Some yeah. will be okay. They're all going to be filled to the brim, filled to the overflowing. Your cup will runneth over. Not everyone's going to be the same. There's a hierarchy in heaven. There's a hierarchy on earth. There's a hierarchy in all throughout all reality. That's, yes. one, of, that's one of the things that people don't like about Christians, but it's it's reality. Even the phrase the seven heavens matches the idea that there's seven levels of her purgatory, there's seven levels of hell, and there's seven levels of heaven. Is that an absolute, you know, nailed in stone? It's exactly like this. I think this is the other thing, people, too. They do have a primitive view of the whole thing. You know, when you're on the other side, you're not going to be bounded by the constraints of time and space like we are here. Uh, reality will be much more real, frankly, um, that from all reports. <laughs> and our limitations here, including our limitations of perception and awareness and knowledge, will will not be what they are here. And you know, you know, when we say we're going to be in heaven with the people we love, it's not like it's literally going to be exactly like it is here, only a little nicer. It's it's another level of reality beyond this reality. Do you know what I'm trying to say there, John? I mean, I do know what you're trying to say. My my wife has long held the theory that the sheer inability to imagine what blessedness and joy feels like and looks like is one of the main uh, roadblocks that many skeptics have to believing in heaven because they can't picture it in their head. They have vague ideas of pearly gates and golden streets and Clouds with uh, men and uh, sitting on them plucking harps, but they don't have the idea of, you know, the Library of Eternity, where all the all the other books that Tolkien never wrote on Earth are written there, the uh, the world making uh, 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 academy where you get to create your own planet the same way uh, Christ made Earth and to invent your own species of animals and so on and so forth. Where you can probably uh, do things like teleport, where you can probably do things. Oh, no. like that is actually that is actually Catholic uh, a tradition. The the four properties of a glorified body are that they are agile, which means they can go anywhere at the speed of thought. That they are uh, impassive, which means disease, pain, and death can never touch them. That they are radiant. That they are uh, clear, uh, uh, clarified. That means they shine with perfect beauty and and, and uh, a blinding light. And that they are uh, subtle, which means you can walk into a locked room just like Christ did after he came back. Yeah. So. Even if you look at who we were when we were in the garden, people tend to think the tale of Adam and Eve is something very similar, but they were more or less in heaven. Yeah. You know, they had the power to, name. you know, it said, you know, Adam had the power to name things, which is really an incredible power. If you really think of that one through for a little while, um, literally the power to name things. I you know. use that in many of my, many of my science fiction and fantasy stories. And what does it say? They were given dominion over all the earth. Now, that to me implies a level of control and ability over things that we don't have here. I think the saints uh, 
when they appear in visions or when they, uh, before they die, the miraculous things they can do would be a matter of course for unfallen man, for man in paradise, including things like calling up storms or banishing them, walking on the water, being in two places at once. All the things that your saints could do is merely the ordinary ordering of nature according to the will of God. Nature is put under us, it's put under the command of human beings. Right. And the reason why it rebelled against us, and the reason why there's things like storms and diseases and, and dangerous animals, is because we rebelled against God. I mean, St. Francis had, was not worried about wolves. They didn't hurt him. You know, you know we probably need to be um, wrapping up soon, but I, I want to go back to, you know, one of the main reasons I'm Catholic is because to be honest, I grew up with sola fide, sola scriptura Christianity, and I felt scarred by it. This is just part of my testimony, and this is why it kind of limits the channel, because Protestants get real mad at us, sola fide and sola scripturists get mad at us. I, I, it's literally easier for me to talk to like a Jew or, or a Hindu sometimes than like a Calvinist, mm -hmm. um, because they read the Bible so wrong. And to me, one of the worst things is they make Jesus scary just because saying, if you don't believe, you're going to go to hell. And to the naturally kind of insecure agnostic mind, that so sounds like an, uh, you know, a threat. You will believe this yeah. or but perish. And there are Calvinists by this. By the way. Well, let me finish this. No, let me finish. There are Calvinists who will grind that in, even to a kid. So if you don't believe, you're going to hell, period. And, and it becomes an intellectual proposition, you know, get the right intellectual proposition and you get your magic ticket to hell, to, to heaven. And if you refuse the intellectual proposition because it seems confusing or hard to believe for you, there's something wrong with you and you're going to hell. And that's, that's, I, I have nothing to, I can't deal with that kind of Christianity. Do you, want to know the name, do you want to know the name of the first heretic of all heretics in history? What? Simon the Magician. He's mentioned in the scriptures. Sure. He's the guy from which we get the word simony, the, the buying of church offices. He was a Gnostic. The Gnostics believe that salvation is not through faith, but through assent to an intellectual proposition. So if your Protestant friends are saying that assent to an intellectual proposition is necessary for salvation, then they're not agreeing with Luther or Calvin or the other mainstream Protestants. Uh -oh. they're, they're Gnostics at that point. They don't phrase it that way. You know, they won't say right. it's about accepting an intellectual proposition, but the, no, really, this 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 is what I call hijack. Do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead uh, and and did it? You know, was the Messiah, was the King, was your Lord? Do you accept Him as your personal Savior? Now, you're you're about to say yes to all those questions, John, and so would I. Would I but say? but this is the salvation question, and if you if you can say you fully a hundred percent believe that, you're saved and you're done. And if you doubt that, your your salvation is You're not done. Christ said that no one can, no one whom God puts in his hand can be plucked out of his hand, by which he means the devil can't pluck you out of the hand of Christ. But you can jump out of his hand. Heck yeah. You're not, and I, do, I, I don't believe for a second it's about ex it, believing the right intellectual thing. It's, it's not a observer. No, in, in fact, we can't. How can you understand intellectually God? He's infinite, we're finite. How can Mr. A or Flatland understand the hypercube? It's not going to happen. Right. What we, what we have is poetry and images for things we can't grasp for a reason, and then some deductions from those those uh, uh, su supernatural things with natural reason to come to certain conclusions that the Holy Spirit has confirmed are true and correct, such as the immortality of the human soul. That is a, that is a that is a true thing taught by the church, and we know it's true because it's taught by the church. Okay. I don't recall any passage in the Bible that says the soul is eternal. In the uh, in the scripture, maybe it's there. I just don't remember where it is. But but uh, once you get into the once you get into the proposition of thinking, you know what God is like, that you know the basis on which He judges who gets to heaven and hell. Yeah. That you that you think you understand how His justice works. I, I recommend you either if you're Protestant, read the Bible again. If you're a Catholic, go talk to your living church again. Because we don't understand God any more than a child, a baby understands his, his father. But even a child knows, even if the child is too young to speak words and can't put it into words, he knows his father loves him. He knows his mother loves him. Yes. I mean, we, we, we do know what we know. And, okay, and that knowledge can't be shaken from us. The only thing we have to put aside is these 
temptations of things that it seems reasonable to begin to doubt, but the doubts are never rational. The doubts are never reasonable. If it seems unreasonable to believe in the hellfire, to believe that there are some people who will damn themselves forever because they hate God that much, if that seems irrational to you and, you, and you're going to say, well, that can't be right. God must not exist. That, that doubt is not, is not logical. Return to, your, return to your first axioms. Return to your premises. Return to your first belief. Cleave to the things you knew as a child about God. That's reality. You might not be able to put it into words, but it's real. Here's what I would say about an orthodox, as an Orthodox, apostolic, uh, Catholic Christian. Um, those who I, I truly believe, those who truly seek the logos and 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 never waver from wanting to find it, or 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 at least if they waver it, they, they always turn back because they want to know the truth. They want to know. They want to know. They'll either find their way to Jesus, or I've often, everybody gets that final, uh, I, I think, I can't prove it, but I think everybody gets the final sip of the cup um, if it's not revealed to you in the course of your ordinary life. I, I, do, I believe people can choose hell and do, because I've met them. Uh, you can get testimony from people who say, uh, yes, this is where I want to go because I hate your God. Okay, so, I mean, to me, it's obvious that it can happen, but yeah. I do also think, Without a doubt, your best bet is, is, is through the doors of the, of the public, visible Catholic Church because Christ gave us the sacraments for a reason. He gave us the sacramentals for a reason. They are medicine for a sick world. They are a way, are, are, are a way of expressing our love for God. They are gifts that God gives us that heal us. There is a reason if you want to get to know the Logos, you want to get to know the truth, you go get yourself baptized, you learn about and accept the Eucharist, and um, there's your best path. And honestly, it sounds like a terrible path, but it's actually pretty easy. And most regular church-going Catholics who go to Mass and, all, and go to confession regularly are remarkably stable. I also, just for the sake of my pagan friends, I also think there are virtuous pagans who make it into heaven. Yeah, I think they're the ones who, although not knowing Christ, actually sought him their whole life, but they didn't know call him by that name. C.S. Lewis had a character like that in one of the Narnia books, too. Indeed, named M.S., the Calamine. Yeah, was, was obviously a stand-in for a Muslim or something. Right. Uh, I would like to believe those are true. There are going to be hardcore Christians who said that this is impossible, but I don't want to argue with them. I want to believe that's true. Hmm? The reason why I'm a Catholic and not a hardcore, uh, simplistic Christian who believes a simplistic thing is because I think life is complicated. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's just one easy, obvious answer. I don't think he get his Mary. Maybe she sat next to him. And, uh, exactly. All righty. Well, so this has been fun. But really, folks, I would just urge you, if, if, if the topic of hell is, this, is upsetting you, walk away from the people just constantly threatening hellfire at you because it probably will make you neurotic. There, there, there's, listen to the things we've said here, and we can give you other things on the topic. Yeah, I would say absolutely hell has to be real. If nothing else, because it's very clear to me that there are some human beings who really do want to be there, period. Okay. Gotta, but at the Let same time... Huh? Let me say one last thing, and then I'll shut up. If, if God is warning you how to avoid hell, he's the cure. Yep. Love is the cure for loneliness. When Christ speaks of hell, he speaks of a region of an outer darkness where the light is not, where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. He's talking about loneliness. He's talking about what you get when you lose love. What you get when you lose love is you get hate and you get self-hatred. You get misery. Yeah. You get loneliness. So if a guy says to you, well, if you don't love and learn how to fall in love, then you will be lonely. That's not a threat. That's just the nature of reality. Yes. If you're, you choose... the light, you're in the dark. Okay. If you flee the light, you'll be in the dark. You can claim that you didn't want the dark, that you wanted to somehow still be able to see and be warm, even though you ran away from where the light and the heat was coming from. But your choice, your decision is, is not ambiguous. You're not going to have any excuse. No one's deceiving you. It's yep. going to be there. There you go. So, so, all right, everybody. Yeah. And so, again, I'm going to say you want to th stop thinking that it's just God's going to punish you because you believe the wrong thing. It is nowhere near that simple, even uh, for all but the most hardcore 
And I think fundamentalist Christians, even some fundamentalist Catholics, it's never that simple. What you really want to be doing is thinking, am I following the logos? Am I seeking the logos? Am I seeking the truth? And am I diligently seeking the truth? And remember, no, we really do believe most people don't go straight to heaven. There's going to be work to do on the other side. Better to work it off now before you get over here, uh, before here, uh, before you get over there. And yes, by the way, your treasures in heaven will be affected by the choices you make here. It doesn't mean you know so it does matter all these things matter even if you think hell is mostly empty or or semi-empty or completely empty uh all of this still matters and seeking the truth and according your according your life according to the truth is the way of doing it and jesus is the way and the truth and the life all right so there we go so everybody tomorrow night we're doing our podcast again with the freedom from atheism foundation we have an interview with a, a, a rabbi who's critical state of israel coming up probably on friday we are here every night but Sundays. We're not on Sundays anymore. But otherwise, please give us a like. Please give us a subscribe. Please find us on BitChute. Please find us on WeGather app. Please find us on Dissenter. We are moving away from mainstream social media completely. And uh, check out sci-fi right.com. And God bless everybody.